Charlie Mowat, who died on May 6, 2014, was one of Canada's most celebrated and widely read authors. He was also one of the earliest of what would come to be known as environmentalists. The roots of Farley's environmentalism probably go back to his service as a very young soldier in the Second World War, where he learned what a vicious, destructive animal the human being can be. Heartsick and discouraged, he went to the Arctic as a biologist. There he renewed his childhood fascination with animals and also found Aboriginal people living in relative harmony with nature, but ignored or denigrated by the government that claimed to be taking paternal care of them. The result was classic animal books like Never Cry Wolf and stinging, angry social commentary like People of the Deer and The Desperate People. For the rest of his life and throughout all his books, he continued to celebrate the non-human world, the world of what he called the others, and also to dissect the nobility and wanton savagery that he found blended in human nature. He wrote children's books such as Lost in the Barrens and Owls in the Family, books about the sea, historical studies and speculations, and innumerable memoirs. Books like The Dog Who Wouldn't Be, The Grey Seas Under, and The Boat Who Wouldn't Float made him one of the world's most beloved storytellers. But he had another incarnation as the uncompromising author of environmental books, books like Rescue the Earth and A Whale for the Killing. A few of his environmental books tell stories that are almost unbearable to read. In this interview, I concentrated on his bleak, illuminating masterpiece, Sea of Slaughter. When I asked him to do this interview in 2009, he was 88, and he wasn't sure he had the strength to do a sustained interview of this kind. And did he have the strength? You be the judge. I want to, um, I want to start where nobody wants to start except me. <laughs> and, uh, and you then, can't start that low down. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be, if censor, it would be censorable. Uh, well, censorious. If it turns out to be yeah, that... I'm getting, all, I'm getting all my breaks off early, see? Yes, From yes. From here on, I'll become okay. gradually more and more coherent. I, that would be deplorable. <laughs> <laughs> I would hate to see you absolutely coherent. And if you turned serious on us, we'd be in real trouble. Yep. No, I want, do want to start where nobody else wants to start, and that is with Sea of Slaughter, uh, which I, I think, uh, as you know, is, is perhaps your masterpiece, the book you were born to write, and probably the book of yours that people least like to read. Um, well, it's the one I least like to read. In fact, uh, I can't reread it. Uh, I have tried upon occasion, and on all the occasions I've got maybe, oh, half a chapter under my belt, and then uh, I started to do an anesthetist job with the nearest bottle, whatever it might be. And when I was totally unconscious, the book fell, on, fell out of my hand, and that was the end of it. Now, it's a book that I can't read, and I don't see how the hell anybody else can. It's unreadable because it is such an accurate and devastating, you'll pardon the adjectives, uh, devastating example, or, or not example, but revelation of the devil that is mankind. It's a scary book. It's a scary book. I'm glad you think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. How did you come to write it? Well, maybe tell us a well, little bit more about it. What, what, what it is that you, what it is that the book encompasses, and how you came to 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 write a to write a book that even you find it difficult to read. It all started as an, uh, a part of uh, research. You know, research will lead you almost anywhere, and usually does. And I was doing some research into whether or not there had ever been an animal called the gray whale in the Atlantic. There is one in the, in the Pacific, and uh, as we all know, it almost was exterminated, it's not coming back. But uh, I had my suspicions that they may also have existed in the North Atlantic, and uh, that they had been exterminated there by uh, whalers, totally exterminated, in recent times, that is to say, in the 18th century and 19th century. But uh, my research into this led me to an enormous uh, archive, and the way I got there is, is convoluted, we won't go into it but uh, through a couple of individuals who are quite remarkable themselves, an archive of uh, original documents from that period, from fishermen, from uh, travelers, from uh, traders, from people who were living or moving along the Atlantic coast, North America at that time. And uh, when, once we got into these things, it began to turn up references to, the, to what was obviously the gray whale, that was fine. But they began to turn up a continuous, or they did turn up a continuous uh, record of the most colossal destruction of life 
that has ever been recorded, in my opinion, as far as my knowledge, uh, on this planet. Uh, destruction of life, a, a holocaust on a scale that uh, nobody could possibly contemplate without horror and distress and despair. And I got deeper and deeper into this and began reading this stuff. And of course, the worse it got, there's a kind of compulsion in horror. And the more horrific this story got, the more compulsive my desire to find out everything there was to know about it. And it took me, well, about three, four years, I guess, uh, of investigation with a lot of help from two uh, very, very good research people in Montreal to really uh, scour the, uh, the record. And then I was left with this tremendous, horrendous pile of evidence which if it had been brought to some court in the sky of the great maker uh, and used as evidence uh, to prosecute uh, the case for the destruction of mankind would have made it a, an instant success of the case and we would be gone. This, it's that bad. The record of what we did and what we chose to do, not just what we did, but what we chose to do and why we chose to do it, is so appalling that the human mind cannot, or will not, it could, but will not accept it. Uh, readership for this book is an ever-diminishing <laughs> number, not increasing, and that's one of the reasons. People open the book, read a chapter, read a paragraph sometimes, say, no, it's not for me, like, oh, <laughs> not for that. <laughs> I'll watch television for a while and recover my, my uh, natural bent for destruction. Uh, we won't read this kind of crap. So, well, that in, in a nutshell is, is really the story of Sea of Slaughter. The only time, the only time I, I was really, it, it, it almost crossed the threshold into human cognizance was uh, when uh, a young filmmaker in Halifax uh, read the book, and was, and he read it, and it gripped, it gripped him so, so deeply that he wouldn't rest until he'd made a television film of it. And uh, he was lucky enough to have an in at that time with uh, the nature of things. It was before uh, Mr. Suzuki took control. Uh, you could still do things that were really outside the pal. And he, he sneaked in on this. And uh, they let him make a two-part uh, nature of things of the book. And he did as well as could possibly be done by any human being at that time with the equipment available and so on, and, and my reluctant cooperation, and produced a film which had exactly the same effect that the book did. It produced a colossal silence, a silence with just a barely perceptible echo at the level of the subconscious, and the echo was not guilty. It was us, our voice. So it fell into the pit too. Well, there's a certain sensation that this can't possibly be true as you read it. Right? <laughs> and, and there must have been the same sensation for you yeah. as you went through the research that, you know, mm -hmm. can this possibly be so? Well, re re repetition demonstrated that. I mean, it, uh, there was no choice. When you've read, say, 10 or 10, 20, even 20 different people from different walks of life, from a Basque whaler in the, in the 1680s to a, a Protestant minister coming ashore in Cape Cod in, in 1800, and they were all saying exactly the same thing about the same particular subject, whatever species of animal I happened to be dealing with at the time. He reached a stage where you, there was no question about, about question. You couldn't question it. It was unquestionable. It was in, ineradicably true. Uh, it was also, and this is uh, where I have a lot of fun with uh, some of my critics, it was also absolutely factual. The two, uh, two had combined, they'd come together in a perfect unity of death and destruction. Uh, when this point had been reached, there was no way that you could, I could reject it. There was no way I couldn't continue with the horrible d process of, of putting it on paper, of suffering it. I had to suffer that goddamn book for almost five years in total before it was, before it was published. Uh, but I don't want to get into my suffering because this is a record of the suffering that we have inflicted as a single species, that we have uh, inflicted upon the whole of animate creation. Uh, it's restricted in its uh, compass to the maritime region, but that's a minor restriction 
in effect, it tells us what we have done, what we have succeeded in doing for the last three or four hundred years to the entire planet. It's a foretaste, or could have been if it had been available to us much earlier, uh, of, the, the, of what the future held for us as the dominating force upon Earth. Give us some examples of, uh, or yeah, give us some examples of of, uh, of some of the stories you found, some of the uh, some of the exterminations that took place. That... Oddly enough, it's difficult. There are so many possible examples that they form a blockage in my memory. I really don't want to look. At, I want to go there again. I was there, and I've been there, and I was there for so long, and I endured so much that I just don't want to go back. And my subconscious is offering a resistance even to Donald Cameron. But I'll tell you this, uh, if you must have an example, the, the obvious one would be the whales, the great whales. That uh, by around 1480, thereabouts, when the Basques, the first Europeans to actually arrive in our waters in any numbers, there had been lots of individual explorations and so on, and people blown here and there before that. But around 1480 or thereabouts, the Basques began arriving in the Straits of Belle Isle and in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in numbers, big numbers. They were whalers. They used to overwinter on the north shore, of, at least on the south shore of the Labrador, parts of Newfoundland and so on, here, even here in, in Cape Breton. Uh, and they set up whaling factories on shore. And uh, they hunted three whales in, in numbers. In those days, they only had ships, at least sailing ships, of course, and, and boats. They didn't have high power. Uh, steam or motor-driven launches and, and, and harpoons, uh, gun harpoons, that sort of thing. They hunted from small boats and uh, sailing vessels and they hunted with hand harpoons. So what they needed was a whale they could catch, obviously. But there were three species that were uh, so horrendously abundant that they didn't need to go beyond these three. Uh, these were the right whale, uh, the uh, southern right whale, the uh, Greenland whale, and the gray whale. These are colloquial names for them. They're three separate species. They were so abundant in migration, and they came used to come into the, into the Gulf in the same way that the harp seals still do to this day. What's left of the harp seal herds, incidentally, and we won't get into that and the destruction there. That's just something I don't want to talk about. But the whales were still so abundant in those days that in, in, their, in their migration, they would come into the Gulf in vast numbers probably the tens of thousands, maybe the hundreds of thousands. There's every indication from the ossuaries, the bone yards, at the whaling uh, stations, the old Basque whaling stations, and from other things that I could describe, that they were here in numbers that, in fact, there are descriptions in some of the early, early uh, voyagers through the Gulf, not the Basque, but people who were, who were sailing, uh, trying to, like Champlain, trying to uh, find a way into the interior, where they complained of the difficulty of sailing their ships in the Gulf of St. Lawrence because of the abundance of whales. Uh, you, you couldn't sail between them. You, you were sort of bashing into whales every time you turned around. Uh, but anyway, the bass were very effective killers of their t at their time. They destroyed the gray whale in the, in the eastern Atlantic, which is off the Bay, Bay of Biscay and, and off Portugal and Spain and so on. And that's what, why they'd come across the Atlantic. They were trailing the last of them. And they'd found this new, huge uh, abundance of gray whales. Between, uh, 18, between 1460, these are approximate dates, and probably 1560, in 100 years, they totally decimated these three most abundant species of whales. They did it to a degree that the animals have never recovered. The gray whale never did recover. It was wiped out except for a tiny remnant, which was polished off by New England whalers in the next century. The uh, uh, southern right whale is still, it's the one we hear about, occasionally gets caught in, in nets uh, off uh, Bay of Biscay, off uh, Bay of Fundy and so on. Uh, and, and the Greenland whale, which is the Arctic, Arctic right whale, are all, the, the two survivors of the three, are just barely surviving just barely, and we, you know, we, we watch them and say, well, I wonder if there'll be 10 calves born this year, mm -hmm. uh, and well, if they'll escape being run over by ocean liners and so on. But effectively, they were just wiped out. Now, in, in I can't remember the, the and year. And by when? Hmm? By when? Oh, they were wiped out within 100 years, between, between 1430, roughly, and, and 1550. Wow. 
well, a little later, maybe it's a little later. Then, then the bass uh, ran out of, uh, of these easy to kill whales. And, 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 bat, and whaling, whaling almost ended for a while because there was no steam yet. No industrial uh, machinery that could overtake the faster whales, the rock whales, so-called, which include the fin and the and the uh, great whales. Uh, so for a while, whales were they couldn't they, all the easy ones had been killed, been destroyed, and there was a, a, a diminishment of whaling. It picked up again. Uh, well, I'm getting into another story. We won't go into that. But anyway, uh, back in uh, I would not matter what year, Claire and I drove up the west coast of Newfoundland. Uh, it was before before that highway was completed. It was gravel, dirt, and soft, and just holes. Uh, and we passed several stretches where the roadway, and it was followed the shore, was paved literally with bone. And when I began to stop the car, he stopped the car because you know, we just hit one, or we stopped the car because there was one ahead of me that was too big to go over. When we got out and looked, they were all whale bones. No, I'm not a cetologist, so I was unable to identify the species. But they, 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 they were, the numbers of whales on this shore, on the west coast of Newfoundland, along the, the highway there, was so great that the uh, constructors, the highway constructors, had deliberately used them for ballast in, in the, building the roads. And they sent their, their front end loaders out to the beach and just dug these things up by the ton, brought them in and dumped them. They made fine ballast, you know, they, they, you could build a great highway on them. And to this day, uh, people who drive out to uh, the, the, the Straits of Belisle on the west coast of Newfoundland are driving on, on, on an almost continuous whale cemetery for much of the way. Now, that was known at the time. It's been known since. But do you ask any cetologist or any scientist, and scientists, by the way, are, include the, the greatest liars since preachers. We won't get into that either until later. <laughs> But uh, they will say, no, 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 it couldn't possibly be any whale bones here. We, we haven't seen any. No, and they haven't, but never mind, <laughs> they're there. <laughs> anyway, that was the end of the whales. That's an example. You asked for one example. Mm. Well, shit, I can give you in that book, and I do give in that book, examples from every genera, every kind of animal, from, from reptiles and fish, on, including the cod, of course, uh, up through to all the birds and so on, of species after species after species after species reduced by us from an enormous, vibrant population to a trickle or, or a, a, a nubbin, and in many cases reduced to extinction. Great ox, for instance. And well, tell me about the great ox. Tell me about the great ox. You're really laying it on me, aren't you? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think this, this, story, this story needs to be told, and, and you know, you've done your best to, to tell it, and I guess I'm trying to do my best. Yeah, I know what you're trying to do, to and I, I know what you're it, trying you know? to do, and, and I appreciate it. Yeah. But it, it's becoming increasingly difficult to, for me to do this. The Great yeah. Auk. The Great Auk, about the same period, for 15th century, was the most, one of the most numerous, if not the most numerous, uh, certainly it constituted the largest biotic mass weight of living animals uh, uh, in the avian world, the bird world, uh, in the North Atlantic. It was found on both sides of the North Atlantic. Uh, it uh, nested on uh, uh, rocky islands, unoccupied islands, well off from shore where it couldn't be reached by predators. And the reason it chose these was because it was flightless. Uh, it was the original penguin. It was known as the penguin, and that was the original Basque name for it. Uh, we have seen, all seen photographs of uh, enormous masses of penguin in the Atlantic, in, in the Atlantic, uh, in the Antarctic. Well, they're a related uh, animal, but not the same, not even the same uh, class, the same genera, rather. But the the great auk, which was uh, a knock, not a penguin, as we see it today, was so abundant. It was equally abundant with the way they are, the way they, the namesake is in the Antarctic today. And they occupied this whole of the North Atlantic, the entire coast from Britain right around to Iceland, to Greenland, and all the way down to Labrador, and down to here, and down as far as Cape Cod. They uh, were used extensively by the first uh, fishermen 
from Europe who came across here who fished the Grand Banks. They needed bait because they were they were fishing with hand lines and and uh, and long lines and so on. So they they, they were bait fishermen. Uh, the bait was was great ox. They would. Uh, Anchor or 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 more uh, offshore of one of these little islands, the, the the funks in the Gulf is one set. There there are little islands like this all the way along the coast, and some of them still bear the names uh, which are relevant to the pe the penguin, the great otter. And they would go ashore on their boats, and they would slaughter these animals because these birds, which were big, they were big as geese, you just whack them on the head with a paddle with an oar, and uh, knock them down. Uh, then they boiled them up on the spot to get, uh, no, the first, first of all, they cut them up for, for bait. And then they discovered that these animals were so fat, these birds were so fat, that they, if they boiled them, they could get oil. And oil was the second most valuable product of the sea in those days. Fish itself, protein was one, but oil was, was, was maybe even more valuable because it was it had an enormous uh, variety of uses in Europe. So anyway, the great, the great auk provided uh, both meat for bait meat to eat, but that was small, and but oil. So they started doing it systematically. They, they would set up uh, refineries on these, on these little islands, and they would drive the birds, which couldn't fly. They'd get between them in the water and drive them to a killing ground in the center, slaughter them with clubs. Millions, literally, literally millions of them, and until they had destroyed the entire great auk population of the whole North Atlantic. Uh, the last survivors were apparently two great auks or three on the island of Circe, a tiny island off the south coast of, of Iceland, which were discovered uh, around the middle of the 19th century by some egg collectors. Great auks egg by then, of course, had become uh, like gold. Uh, if you could find a great auks egg, uh, it could be sold to a collector, a human collector uh, of uh, rarities for five, ten thousand dollars, whatever. Anyway, two Icelandic fishermen found these last three ox. They had one egg. They killed the three ox and smashed the egg. And that <laughs> was the end forever, forever of the great ox. But it's, it's just one story. I could go on like this for hours if I, if I had the, the stamina and the endurance, but I don't have either. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and let me take you back to something that's maybe a bit more congenial, I, but I really appreciate your willingness to do that. Let me go back to childhood. It's probably more it's childhood. It really had a, some magical quality about it that's in many of your books. And it has to do with animals. It has to do with your engagement with animals. Um, both domestic, like Mutt, the dog, um, but also wild animals. Tell me a little bit about Farley's getting acquainted with the animal kingdom as a very young person. Well, I was lucky in many ways as a youngster. Uh, I was unlucky in that I wasn't born into an Aboriginal community living as mankind had been living since day one, uh, up until a mere 10, 15,000 years ago when we started to get the smarts. We were, our ancestors up to that age, up to that point, had been living in harmony with, as part and as parcel of the living world around them. That was, those were the terms for life in those days. All forms of life had to follow these, that pattern, had to obey those tenets. But I wasn't lucky enough to be born in that period. I was born in the period after the great crash, as I call it. Uh, which is best symbolized, I suppose, by the Industrial Revolution, but it goes back earlier than that. It goes back to a couple of thousand B years BC when we began to discover our technical expertise and discover that we were no longer necessarily subordinate to the laws of nature, that we could start bending the laws, and then we could start breaking them, and then we could start reconstructing them for our own private end as a species. and. Fuck the consequences to all the rest. So I was born after that period, you see. Uh, but I had an inclination. I don't know where I got it. It may have been genetic, and I can see. I think it's in all children. In fact, I know it's in all children. To this day, I can see it in, in younger young children. 
uh, an, an awareness, an affinity between the young of my species and all other species. It's just there. Well, with me, it had an opportunity to develop because I didn't have much of an affinity with my own species. I was an only child. Uh, I was a newcomer to Saskatoon, for instance, when we went out there as a kid. Uh, I was isolated. I didn't like sports. Believe it, I didn't. I never learned to skate. Son of a gun. Are Thanks, you really man. a Canadian? I'm, I'm a Canadian, yes. and I never learned to skate. Unbelievable. Uh, but I, I, I was not deprived, as, as, as I might well have been, I was not isolated, uh, discarded, rejected by my contemporaries. Well, they, yeah, they did. But the thing was, I wasn't alone because I had this, uh, this genetically uh, present ability to feel an affinity with other animals around me. It saved my neck. It's why I survived. Without it, I would not have survived. I'd have become another lost soul, like the millions of young lost souls you see today. Does that answer your question, or does it just go around in circles? Well, it's, it's, uh, it does answer the question. I was, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about specifics, like some, like the owls or the dogs. or. Um, well, I've already talked the... about the goddammit. If anybody wants to, wants to find out what I, what I experienced, then they can read my bloody books. Well, that, yeah, I so hope they'll do that. Too. I hope they will do that. But the, the dog who wouldn't be is a good example. This is the development of an awareness in me of, uh, of this affinity. This is after, after childhood, looking back on it when the book was written. But it wasn't until then that I became aware of what had happened here, that I had entered into somebody else's world, the world of the, of the, other, the others, as I call them, and that that had sustained me, it prevented me from sinking out of sight. And when I wrote about it, there's a, I notice in rereading this stuff now, bits and pieces, that uh, there's a kind of bewilderment in, in, in me as a writer when I'm writing about it. Obviously, I, you know, what the hell was happening here? The, it was a miraculous thing. I was allowed to enter into the world of the others because I was essentially one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right, you were the... I, yeah, I could, I could leap the gap between, between uh, the, the ever-widening gap between us and all other forms of animate creation. And, and the story of how Mutt, he didn't do this consciously. And I didn't do anything consciously either. I just did what came naturally. Yeah. And in the process, I was supported, buoyed up, given hope, given joy, given a sense of belonging, a sense of merit as a result of this, for which I am eternally grateful. And old Mutt, God bless you wherever you are. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, one of the, one of the first of the famous Moet dogs, I mean the first really mm -hmm. of the famous Moet dogs, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, of which there have been some spectacular, uh, he's had some spectacular successes. Well, it works both ways. If, if you are in association with one of the others, and you can somehow overmaster your not contempt so much as, as egotistical self-satisfaction in being human and relax that and extend the tentacles of connection to the other animal, you'll get a response like that unless the other animal has already been fucked up by human beings. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot too. But if the other animal is natural and in the, is, is okay, it will respond automatically. Never a second thought about it. Yeah. If it thinks the way we think, and I presume it does, it just is responding to what comes naturally. We are one form of life. There's only one form of life on this earth, and it's we are part of it. This is not the Gaia hypothesis, but it is my own version of it. There's no distinction between us physiologically, psychologically, biologically, uh, theologically between us and any other form of life, there, there is no basic difference. There is a distinction in degree and in, in the, the way we react and have reacted, but there is no essential difference. They are us, we are them. Well, it's, it's, I sometimes think that you're uh, almost the inventor or certainly one of the very early proponents of what they now call deep ecology. I just did a, Wonder had a wonderful interview with Paul Watson a couple of weeks ago. 
and uh, Paul gets a lot of flack because he takes the view that human beings are only one species among many, and, and in fact there are rogue species, that uh, mm -hmm. a rogue species and a destructive oh, one. Oh, he's but dead that's, on. But that's, that's Farley Mowat's view too, and yeah. you came to that I think quite a long time before before uh, Paul did. Yes, well, and I it's think... It's very offensive to a lot of people, the idea that, oh, that we are only one species. Could, to any kind of, an, of a human establishment, it's virulently offensive. A religious establishment, for God's sakes, they think I'm the spawn of the devil. And, and not just me, but people like Paul Watson, they see him as if it's a virtual devil, yeah. you know. Uh, but uh, that's a minor price to pay for salvation. And by God, I, you know, whatever else I, I've lost in my life, I've lost a lot, I found that, I found salvation. Salvation for me is the awareness, the certainty that I'm part of something a hell of a lot bigger, more enduring, more important, and perhaps more purposeful than humanity. So that, this, this carries me on. I can, I can watch us uh, commit the kind of atrocities that no other animal on earth would ever think of committing, or even feel like committing, apparently, as far as we know. Uh, through war, through economic deprivation, through imperialism, through all this shit that we have stirred up and spread across the face of the planet. I can look at all that and say, well, <laughs> thank God, you know, uh, I, it's not my doing. I don't belong to that group. Well, I, I see, you know, when I look at, at, at the life of Farley Mowat, it starts off with this early awareness that you are part of the living whole, and that you are connected with the with the animals, and that you feel closer to the animals in many respects than you do to your own your own species. Mm -hmm. The other animals, please. The other animals, yeah. yeah. The see, others. see, you're having trouble with the concept too. Well, yeah. uh, why not? You've spent your you must be at least fifty years old. Oh, oh, oh. oh uh, next, and, next year. Well, next year. Yeah. And you, you spent that <laughs> entire half century being being inculcated with the belief that you are a member of the superior fucking species. Yep, and it's just yep. dawning on you. Well, it's already dawned on you, but, but you're having trouble dealing with that. Well, it's built into the way we talk about these things, that, yeah. that, that there are the animals and then there are us. And, yeah. And, well, that's and part that's, of the game. It is, and, sure. it's, and it's part of the yeah. book of Genesis, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it this is how you make like yourself that. an alien in your own space. Yeah. And that's yeah. what we've done. We, 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 there are no aliens out there. There's an alien yeah. here. And it's human homo sapiens. We are the aliens in the universe. Well, and you know, as I as I as I look at Farley's Farley's life and career, um, it seems to me that there's a there's a very this is a very hard won set of insights, and and uh, and it comes you've had event after event after event mm -hmm. that has driven that the evidence of that home to you. I mean, I'm thinking of going off to war when you're still a very very young man, mm -hmm. and that awful experience of of, uh, of the European War. And then the and then the whale in Virgil, and then the work that leads to Sea of Slaughter, which is like a, in an earlier conversation you were described it as being like going through a civilian war, writing the sea, writing mm -hmm. Sea of Slaughter, having an impact on you similar to the impact that the war had on you. Mm -hmm. And um, it's taken a long time, and there's, but there's been an awful lot of episodes that have led you to where you stand today in these subjects. Right? Yeah, of course. And, uh, you, you didn't include everything that uh, that I had to, uh, every mountain I had to climb. No, that sounds so goddamn prideful and egotistical, and it's not meant no, to. Right. But it doesn't include every quagmire that that I had to uh, escape from. One of the worst was the quagmire of science, because before the war, I believed, because I had been induct, indu in, in, inculcated with the the concept that philosophy was a pure intellectual exercise that led to truth. Uh, so I, and I was interested in birds and animals. I was one of them. I was part of it. I was fascinated by them. So I became, I, the ambition became to be a scientist. And I fell into their goddamned uh, claws, the claws of science, uh, and they tried to make me into what they were, which was not students of life, but students of death. Biology, when I took it at university, was not the study of life, bios. It was necrology, the study of death. We learn to kill without a conscience. We learn to kill any species you wanted, you name it. 
We could tear it apart. We could, we could, we could kill it in en masse. We could kill it individually. We could torture it to death. Always with the explanation that we were doing this for the good of science to discover the truth. And it was a lot of lies, <clears throat> a lot of crap. Getting out of that trap, getting out of that trap was perhaps the most difficult one of all. The war, the war helped me get out of it, because then yeah, there you went straight back into it after the war, right? Hmm? I, mean, well, I went back into it. Yeah, yeah. 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 It took it took. A, so how did you get out of it? Right? Well, it was, uh, I suppose the best way you can find out about that is read about it in a book called <laughs> Otherwise, which is my last book, uh, in which I try to describe, or at least I try to to give a feeling for the awareness that gradually overwhelmed me that these other animals were not my subject matter for, for dissection, for description, for dissertation. They were my brothers and my sisters. They were my blood. And then the scale fell off. And from then on, I had to reverse my entire goddamn behavior pattern. You know, get rid of the goddamn guns. Get, stop killing things that simply annoyed me or irritated me. Or stop killing for sport, for fun, to, uh, to alleviate the bloodlust, you know. I had to stop killing. And I did. It took a long, long time. And apart from a, from a few politicians, one of whom is in residence right now in Ottawa, uh, we won't go into names because I don't want these, the uh, riot squad here until this show is over. Uh, but apart from them, uh, I, I feel this amiability towards all forms of life now, including perhaps the most despicable and the most pathetic of all. And I underline the word pathetic. Us. Yeah. And uh, um, and we may well well we have taken down huge numbers of species already, and we may be taking down even more, or you know, uh, an escalating. Oh, uh, there is hope. Mm -hmm. Tell me. There about is the hope. hope. Well, the hope is is obvious. I mean, if you, all you got to do is open your newspaper or, or, or watch that idiot fucking box there. You know, <laughs> the hope is that we will eliminate ourselves smartly and <laughs> soon before the damage we have done becomes irreparable. That supports me in my uh, few remaining years. In fact, I'll drink to that. <laughs> that could be described as misanthropic. It could also be described as enormously optimistic. Yes, and I and suppose positive. in a certain kind of way, life affirming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. concerned with, with the affirmation of life. I'm not concerned with the survival, the ongoing survival at the cost to life of, of mankind. See, I'm struck when we talk about these kinds of things by, by um, certain kinds of ironies. For example, I don't think that you are by nature a pessimistic person. I'm not. Um, I don't think you're uh, by nature, uh, by inclination, a prophet of doom. Um, nope. But I think your experience has pushed you into... A position where I look as if I am, I am these things. A position where it looks as if he's, you know, he's a sour old bastard, and in his final years he no longer can influence anything, have any effect in anything. So he's bitter, and he's 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 get telling us that we we're all doomed to go to hell. Well, that's not true. I am, as you say, an optimist. I really believe. I'm sure. I am really sure that life will continue without us, one way or another. Probably. For the better. Well, life has has proceeded from several great extinctions mm -hmm. in the past, mm -hmm. so I um, you know that there will be a form of life that comes after us. Yeah, they they were they were mass extinctions of, of uh, classes of life, but this is a specific one that we're looking at now. This is the extinction of one aberrant form of life. Oh no, but that's not what I was talking about. What I'm talking about is the fact that we ourselves. Yeah are the cause of a great extinction, comparable to the great oh, extinctions yes, yeah, in the sure. past. Oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, but the earth is somehow, the, the, you know, life has somehow find its, found its way out of those boxes. Mm -hmm. It comes back in a different form. You know, this time it's mammals. Previously it seems to have been you know, uh, reptiles. Um, no, I just, you know. thought, I just thought of a simile here. I don't know if it will work or not. 
but I've just uh, spent three weeks uh, wrestling with a peculiar ailment which afflicted me not very long ago and laid me flat in my ass and I can still have trouble getting around. It's, uh, I contracted a bacterial infection in my legs which I now discover, or I'm now told, is uh, related to the uh, flesh-eating uh, disease. My version of it, or the, the bacillus that I have, is not the same. But what it did was paralyze me pretty well from, from the hips down. And it took massive attempts, massive uh, uh, applications of uh, antibiotics and stuff like that to, to knock it out. But it has knocked it out. Now, where the hell was I going with this? Well, you had an, you had an image or a simile that was flowing from that, that almost flesh-eating bacillus. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, I guess, I, I guess I'm associating that almost flesh eating bacillus with, with us. Okay. Uh, with us as a form of life, very successful, very virulent, very difficult to deal with by the rest of life, which uh, we is now has infected the planet. So if. Um, if nature, the natural world, natural nature, if life itself can rid itself of real threats to its continuing existence, and I'm fucking well sure it can, you can tell, I mean the whole history of, of life on earth demonstrates that. If it can do it with other uh, threats, it certainly can do it. We are the primary threat. I underline that. We human beings are the primary threat to the survival and continuation of life on Earth. And I don't think that life is going to put up with us much longer. Well, how do you see that playing out? We think inwardly, always, the human, the human species does. Mm -hmm. Nothing really exists beyond us. Mm -hmm. nothing, mm -hmm. nothing except things that can be exploited. Yes. And that's enough. I, I preached enough. I'll Another tell you, I, I wouldn't have done this for anybody else but you. You know that, don't you? I do. But, but the point is that you got what, what you're getting today uh, and what you're, what you're recording today is, is uh, as close as anybody is going to get to uh, making sense out of what I've been, uh, of who I am or what I am, what I think, you know. So I, I, I feel this is, you're doing me a favor too. Farley Mowat was an inspiration, mentor, and friend to such younger environmentalists as Elizabeth May and Paul Watson and me. Elizabeth and I both dedicated books to Farley and Claire Mowat, and Paul Watson did us one better. He gave the name Farley Mowat to one of Sea Shepherd's anti-whaling ships. Farley, in turn, bailed Watson and his crews out of jail when the need arose. He was a tiger, and we all miss him terribly. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.